explored in the physics department of Wuningham, and also in the chemical literature, I found something interesting. That the ionization energy of a core electron, or carbon, for example, is also correlated with the electronegativity of the carbon. If you define electronegativity using the terminal atoms. And so, well, let's eliminate the middleman, get rid of electronegativity, and then when I graph the ionization energy of the carbon atom against the mean dipole derivative, we get a nice straight line. And it makes sense. You know, if I've got tetrafluoromethane, it's going to be a lot harder to take an electron off of that carbon than of methane. So, methane is here. Tetrafluoromethane is there. But it's still a soft model. We turned this into a hard model when we became familiar with studying the ionization processes. The ionization energy of a 1s electron on a carbon atom or any atom is equal to the electrostatic potential at the nucleus. And that's proportional for atoms to the nuclear charge. For molecules, Siegbaum, the scientist that invented ESCA, had a model. And we applied it to the CFC model. The ionization energy of the 1s electron of carbon, which is equal to the electrostatic potential of the nucleus, is equal to two terms. One term, the potential going to the atomic charge of carbon. The more positive carbon, the harder it is to take off the electron. And the other electrostatic potential going to the atomic charges on the neighboring atoms given by the charge of the neighboring atom divided by its dis distance from the carbon atom, and it's a sum. Well, when you plot this value <coughs> against the mean dipole moment derivative, then you get a hard model. We have a mechanism to explain this linear relationship, and uh, even our correlation coefficient uh, improves somewhat. And so we were satisfied with this explanation for this behavior. Well, what is the consequence of all this? The mean dipole moment theory, <coughs> then you can look at it as a charge like quantity. And in fact, that quantity has often been called and used in hundreds of papers the generalized atomic or tensile charge. Another subject. You know, we don't want the Churrasco to get cold. <laughs> no, no, we will be okay. Uh, then we were looking for another hard model. Chemists tried to explain molecular properties in terms of atomic and our body properties in order to understand electronic structures in an easier way. If I have a molecular property, I would like to express it as a sum of atomic properties plus a sum of bond properties. These are easier to understand. The molecule is more complicated than an atom and probably than a bond. This works very well for atomic masses, helpful, polarizabilities, x-ray scattering factors, electronegativities. Bond properties are more common on still. Bond lengths, bond energies, Bond force constants, bond dipoles. A consequence of all this is characteristic functional rules, which are used to explain chemical reactivities and frequencies. Well, we knew about a G intensity sum rule that Crawford introduced in the 1950s. And here he relates the sum of all the fundamental intensities of a molecule plus a rotational constant which is usually very, very small, or something many times zero, is equal to a sum of atomic contributions in the intensity. And this, these atomic contributions contain one of the polar tensor variants in the numerator and the atomic mass in the denominator. Well, we wanted to see if we could find for fluoro-fluoromethanes express the sum of the intensities for each molecule as a sum of their atomic uh, 
uh, intensive contributions. So we were looking for atomic contributions to the molecular intensity. So this is the sum of molecular intensities. And these it is going to be equal to the sum of the atomic contributions. Well, the electronegativity model of the halomethics then, looking at the numbers and using the graphs I showed you before. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine have their atomic electronegativities with negative signs, as I showed on the graphs before. The electronegativity of the carbon is equal to the sum of the electronegativities of the halogen atoms, but with a positive sign. It's a soft one. We were able to determine these values for, for the atomic contribution to the infected densities and the carbon atomic intensity contributions range methane, which has very weak intensities, 5.1 kilometers per mole, to tetrafluoral methane, which is one of the, the molecule has one of the strongest intensities, more than a thousand kilometers per mole. So we were trying to express it in this way. And we used eight training set molecules, 24 test set molecules. And here's the comparison of the experimental intensities against the calculated intensities. The green was very good. If we would have changed our training set molecules, we could even have done better. But we left it. This was acceptable for our purposes. Well, to try, well, how do we explain that? It's philosophical. Model. We heard about the quantum theory of atoms and molecules by Professor Bayer. We use the Schrodinger equation to get the wave function, which contains the information about the molecular electron density. He does a physical analysis of this density and partitions the molecule into individual atoms. And the molecular properties are some of the atomic properties, which is what we're after. Here's an example of boron trifluoride. These lines are the boundaries of the different atoms. Uh, one of the fluorine atoms here. Here, the, uh, the electron density of boron, of course, it has C2B symmetry, uh, as you expect. And uh, these lines are contour lines there, electronic density contour lines, which you're familiar with. And, uh, you can effectively partition the electron density to the different atoms. Here are gradients, and the, the boundaries of the atoms are determined by what they call zero flux surfaces. Well, so we use the Q theory to compare it with our results from our electronegativity model. The first four or the cutane, which is a hard model. And here's our statistical model, the, electric, the electromagnetic model. And as you can see, the green is very good. And uh, so we were sat with, this is a, currently what we're doing. We haven't published this yet. The atomic contributions to the fundamental IR intensities depend on three factors. Movement of each equilibrium atomic charge in the normal vibration. In the molecule, as the molecule atoms vibrate, their charges move, changes type of moment. Second, atomic charge transfer induced in the molecule owing to the movement of each atomic charge. So, as one charge is, uh, atom is moving, it induces changes in the electronic density of the other atoms. And finally, the change in each atomic dipole during the normal vibration. Oh. I'll stop boring you with my research, and I'll just say a little bit what I did. Uh, my journey, uh, I learned chemometrics really to study infinite densities. But along the way, I became very interested in chemometrics, experimental design. In 1983, I went to a, a, a NATO school, like this is a school, it was a school in Italy. And I was very impressed with a talk by Stuart Hunter of the box Hunter and Hunter book on experimental design. 
I had gone there really to, to learn more about principal components, but then I started really uh, becoming interested in experimental design. And during the years, we have written several books. Well, this is one book, the first one, The Climate Genetic, the author is that's one of the experimentals. And that book not only uh, told you about the experimental design methods, it came with a five and a quarter inch floppy disk with Fortran programs where you could do your response surface calculations. Then we revised the book so much, also, we could not compete with the commercial programs. So we eliminated our little floppy disk and we wrote. Uh, we revised our book extensively and we gave it a new title, Homo Fosser Experimentals. And these are different printings of this book. And we also have uh, the, the book in English in, published by Elsevier. This is the present form of the book. It's published by Bookman Archimedes. Along the way, I could make some money. <laughs> when I started studying thermometrics, Paolo Malufi was the governor of Sao <laughs> <laughs> And our salaries were. And quantum chemistry was no way to make any money at all. <laughs> so, I thought experimental design. Lots of people are interested in experimental design. Not only analytical chemists, chemists in general, engineers, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers. So I was able to give some courses in different industries. Of course, you don't become rich, but still, it's nice to have a little bit of your money, you know? <laughs> Uh, on the way, did lots of applications. I, the best applications I like were mixture models. In the 1980s, I knew about the Box Hunter and Hunter book on response surfaces, but I never heard of mixture analysis. I never heard of mixture models. Uh, Director of Research at 3M of Brazil came to Unicampi and asked me to give a course on mixture models. I said, well, what are mixture models? <laughs> and he showed me the book by Cornell. And that book was not in any of our libraries in, in, in universities. So industry can help you work in the university also, especially with that. Uh, and so, if you know, this is the polynomial use for response surface analysis of independent variables. And the, the mixture models are normally used, we use the Chaffe models, which have the B0 included within these other coefficients, the linear and the quadratic coefficients. It was very hard in the 1980s to publish a paper using mixture models. We were trying to publish a paper in a material science type of journal, and the referee said, no, oh, this is not a good work because you people have just constrained B0 to B0. He did not understand that when you go from when you form Chaffee's model, B0 is already included. And so he knew a little bit about statistics, but it was dangerous because he was completely wrong. And so you were running into referees. Some of them did not like chemometrics whatsoever. And others had a little knowledge, but not enough. But over the years, chemometrics became more accepted. 
and our people started to learn a little bit about the three methods of salt. I got, I got this email about a couple of days before this, uh, last week. It's from Galactic, the most downloaded articles of 2013, the first half of 2013. And uh, they, had, they gave the top five, and not only the first one was on response surface methodology as a tool for optimization of analytical chemistry. In, in fact, it has Brazilian authors that some of you may know. But anyway, uh, it shows that there's still a lot of interest in response surface methods. Optimization is still part of the daily work. And so, uh, I think it's got, um, it's more in the face of much application now that uh, can be done on um, optimization and experimental design. We did become interested at some time with split plot models where we work with partial random execution experiments. And we tried to apply this to natural products chemistry. Professor Yetta will talk about this later on on Wednesday like this. Uh, and this project was with her group. They, they grow a plant in their university. Optimize extraction, and to optimize separation. And then then apply chemoelectric methods like the uh, demo of clustering techniques and principal component analysis. Well, that, the, what I want to emphasize is the optimization of the extraction and the optimization of the separation were done at the same time. And if you have an interaction between extraction variables and separation variables, you're going to have some interaction terms that are important. So you want to optimize it simultaneously. Simultaneous optimization of both mobile phase chromatographic mixtures and extraction mixtures to maximize the number of chromatographic beads extracted from the plant, which is uh, green tea. Oh. The objective was to propose a statistical model for time simultaneously optimizing mixture systems at the interaction effects. And we had to consider the correct air structure. The statisticians have a lot of information about these kinds of designs. And uh, I sometimes have a feeling that people don't always really randomize their experiments when they use experimental designs. But this is one way that you can get around it. So the experimental design is a simplex centroid design. The big triangle represents the mobile phase, uh, the, the extraction solutions, ethanol, ethyl acetate, and dichloromethane. Uh, the little triangles, the components for the mobile phase solutions. And what you want to do, if you randomize completely your experiments, you have to just pick one here, maybe one here, and one over here. But what we did to simplify things is to remember first randomly picking out a little triangle, and then within that triangle, randomly doing the experiments. And then repeating that from the other triangles. These are the mobile phase proportions for the, <coughs> the subplot, what it's called, and these are the extraction solution proportions. And the statistical model, well, it's just a regular polynomial. One for the mobile phase, the other for the extraction. Then you multiply them, the method that Cornell uses, and then you get a nice little equation. And I want to thank you. Never, never, but his mouse, I used it until today. But anyway, it has a lot of terms, and when you use all the terms, Get this response surface. When you just use 12 terms, you get this one. But anyway, uh, the response here is the model uh, for these models uh, for the number of peaks observed at 254 nanometers. Well, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I want to acknowledge, of course, my university, the granting agencies, but most of all, my graduate students and my partner. Thank you very much.